Welcome to Gadavra. This is Will Sanchez. My special guest tonight is Liz Simons. She's a blogger, comedian, and a runner. And she used to run with the Galloway training team. Please welcome Liz to the show. Hi. Thanks for having me, Will. A pleasure to see you. Liz, let's get started by sharing with the audience a little bit about yourself. Little, where were you born? Something about your family? A little bit about your schooling? I'm originally from Massachusetts. Technically, I was born in Beverly, Mass., but I grew up in a small town called North Andover, and right on the New Hampshire border. Um, have been there. My family's been there since I was four years old. My parents still live there, and you know, growing up. I have, I have an older sister and a younger brother. They were far more athletic than I was. Um, I always played sports growing up, but I was always the one that had my head in the clouds. Like when I would play goalie, I would just sit down and pick the flowers in soccer. I just never really cared. I didn't have a competitive bone in my body. Uh, and schooling was different. I was a very good student. I loved school. I was a big, big nerd, loved to read. Um, you know, graduated from high school and then went on to Duke University where I majored in English, minored in history, and uh, it, was, it was a good time. Ex excellent. Yeah. When did your comedic skills kick in? I like to think I was always hilarious, um, but it's interesting. I, I, when I was in college, I had always wanted to be a DJ on the college radio station. That had been my dream. I said, that is, if there's one thing I do when I'm in college, it's get my own radio show. So fortunately, Duke had this really, really great community-run station called WXDU, which was technically part of the university, but it was actually more community-run. So it's mm -hmm. cool because I was one of the very few student DJs that had a lot of people from the community. So there was a lot of continuity from year to year and instead of just every year up in the air. So I used to have my own weekly show, and I used to call it Liz Simons. I don't even, I don't even know if I use my last name, but I would say the song of myself. Um, because I was an English major, I was into Walt Whitman, and I was vain. And I would try to make every song, as fringe as it was, as a joke, connected uh -huh. to myself. Uh -huh. And you know, I would talk in between bits, and it was just me and a microphone. And it's interesting because we actually did have listeners, but when you're alone in a booth, you don't think you're alone. So it's always interesting <laughs> when I would get call-ins, and people would say, one time towards the end of my college DJing career, someone said I was the funniest damn DJ around. And that just meant a lot to me. And it was, it was a ton of fun. It was a blast. And you know, after I graduated from college in 2001, I wasn't quite sure. I wanted to go into radio. Um, but you know it's hard to get a radio job. So I worked in ad sales for two years, which I was terrible at. And then around that time, I moved. I was living in Boston, and I got a new job in the city, working for a matchmaker. That's another story. For a what maker? Uh, a, a Jewish yenta matchmaker. Oh, matching us in uh, yeah, like marriage. a yenta. Yeah, oh, that okay. was crazy. I mean, that's a whole another story. And so th it was just such a funny, weird, crazy experience. And then I heard, I saw, I heard about a comedy course at the Boston Center for Adult, um, yeah, Boston Center for Adult Education back in 2004. And I said, you know what, I've always wanted to try it. Let's do it. And so it was a six-week course. And our graduation was to perform at this really cool comedy club called the Comedy Studio in Cambridge, Mass., which was on top of a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> um, and it's really, it's a really interesting club. Eugene Firm, I'm sorry, Eugene Merman was one of the opening founders of it. And they, it's very small, but a lot of people, when they go back, they'll perform there. It's really a great, the birth, I think, the center of alt comedy in Boston right now. Really? Eugene Merman, is he related to Ethel Merman? <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. Different spelling. <laughs> Different oh, spelling. Okay. Yeah. Wow, that's a, so so fascinating. While you were in college and you were DJing, were you doing any kind of sports? Oh, God, no. I mean, if anything, I always say I gained the freshman. 50 like every year I was very I, if drinking was a sport I was good at flip cup but I definitely I was very anti-exercise in college and it's actually one of the main reasons why I got into running um I was very I mean honestly compared I was probably about 40 pounds heavier than I am now in college but the weird thing is even though Actually, I was only maybe 20, 30 pounds heavier, but I looked so much bigger, and I was so unhealthy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's fine to be that way when you're 20, 21 in a weird way. It, it, well, it's never good, but, you know, I would eat. I always said I took the, the all-you-can-eat buffet, literally. I ate everything till I couldn't eat any more. 
Um, I gained a lot of weight. I was smoked cigarettes. You smoked? Were, I know. It was terrible. And it was North Carolina. They were so cheap. And, you know, call, you the cigarettes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No tax? I know. They were, I mean, God, who knows how much they are now there. But back then, they were 2 $3 a pack. And I'm sure they're more now, but whatever. Um, and so I gained a lot of weight. I was really unhealthy. And I was very, I realized when I graduated from college, I, I knew that if I didn't change my habits then, that I would never change them. That it, this was an opportunity to, you know, kind of go into adulthood and make some really positive, healthy choices. So, and I'd always been very anti-running. After I graduated, I had no job. I was 30, 40 pounds overweight. It was like the most depressing time of my life. Um, I moved back to my parents' house in North Andover, and I joined Weight Watchers. Um, and I decided to join a gym. And I remember when I got weighed in at Weight Watchers, the first time I went, the one boyfriend I had in high school, his mother weighed me in. I was cute in high school. I could just picture her going to her son, Al, Liz really let herself go, and I was mortified. And, but that in, inspired me. I mean, if anything, that really drove me. So I joined the gym, and it was an all-women's gym at first, but then it turned co-ed, but I didn't care. By that point, I would go, you know, I would look for, I used to, it was kind of a, kind of a depressing time. I used to wake up in the morning, watch a couple of hours of Golden Girls on TV, you know, go to the gym, come home, look for jobs, and then repeat. And then once a week, go to my Weight Watcher meeting. Um, and then finally I got a job working for a small radio station and I was still living at home. And I remember one weekend, I, by this point I probably lost about 20 pounds. And I felt I was getting more confident, feeling good, and I wasn't smoking mm -hmm. and, you know, because I was living at home, like, it's not like I was going to the bars every night. Um, the gym was closed and it was like five on a Saturday afternoon and I really wanted to work out. So I said, you know what, I'm going to try this running thing because my dad and my sister were runners. So I remember going to a track because there was no way I was going to be seen running in public. And I also at the time, I have really bad eyesight, but I, I, I didn't think that you could run with your glasses. So I would take off my glasses and run and just hope for the best. I mean, it's a track, so at least you... So it's a circle. <laughs> yeah. But then finally I realized that wasn't true. But I also, my rule when I first started running, if there were people on the track, I wouldn't run. I just wouldn't go. I did not want to be seen running in public. So eventually I realized that was foolish, and I signed up for my first race in Boston in 2002. And it was just a four-miler. I ran it with my dad, and it was awesome. And I, ever since then, I haven't stopped. Excellent. So your dad and your sister, it sounds like you grew into to be the runner in the family. It's interesting. My sister kind of dropped off. She still runs, but she doesn't do as long of distances anymore. She does more CrossFit and strength training, which I also do. Mm -hmm. um, but my father and I, that's kind of our bonding thing. We ran the Vermont City Marathon in Burlington last year, Memorial wow, Day excellent. weekend. And next weekend, Memorial Day weekend, I'm running one in Idaho. He's running the Vermont City one again. Um, by himself or with the other daughter? Or is this by himself, but my mom will be there for support. Okay. And uh, we're actually going to do the New York City Marathon together this you year. You and your dad? Yeah. Oh, that's and he's faster close. than I am. That's the funny thing. When we did Vermont last year, um, we did the Galloway method. So I still, you know, even though I haven't been training as much with you, whenever I do my longer runs, I always do the Galloway. And I always got my trusty sports watch on. And I, I wear this watch everywhere. Like when I'm going to weddings, whatever. People, just to watch? Yeah, it's just a really simple Timex. It's, it was cheap, but it works, and I love it. And I never forget to take it. I mean, I always keep it on. Um, so my dad and I do did the Galway, and it was interesting. You know, by the time I was done the marathon last year, the Vermont City, I was just tired and beat. My father said, I could run another five miles. And I go, oh, shut up. <laughs> um, you know, which is really inspiring for a man who's 60 years old. So he, well, that's not that, that old. No, it's not old at all. But I'm saying that he's, he's in better shape than I'm half his age, and he's in better better shape than I well, am. Well, that only uh, foretells your future. You well, exactly. only get better. I mean, I think that's a great thing about running and why I started running. I've, I've got, I'm competitive with myself. So, you know, it's interesting. I'm running the Brooklyn Half Marathon tomorrow, and I've run that for the, since 2009, and every year I've gotten better. And significant, like, like we're talking my first, the jump between the first two years was six minutes. Last year I was four minutes faster. And it's almost kind of, now I don't, I almost don't like that because now I feel like I put a lot of pressure on myself 
to want to beat it again. But it is interesting how as I've done more strength training, yeah. I've definitely gotten strong. I feel like it's applied to, it's made me well, faster. Well, tomorrow's going to be hot. In fact, they have an advisory. I think you should probably... Well, right. But they always say it's going to be hot. It's, it's been hot the past three years, but it's early enough that ah. it won't be that bad. And so the thing is, yes, I'm not going to... At the end of the day, I really don't care. But um, I would. I set a PR for a 10K last weekend, and I'm not fast. I mean, mm -hmm. that's the whole thing. Like, my PR for a 10K was doing nine and a half minute miles, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is okay, but it's that's not. That's fine, you know. But it's not, I'm not competing with the Kenyans. Okay. So that's what I kind of love about running, how it really is about how you can get better. It's mm -hmm. not, I mean, I'm never going to win. Mm -hmm. I'm never going to qualify for Boston. Mm -hmm. My times for a marathon now wouldn't even get a 78 year old into the the marathon, mm -hmm, the Boston mm -hmm. Marathon. And I'm okay with that. I mean, would I love to qualify someday? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, but realistically, and I don't like to come from a place of no, mm -hmm. but at the same time, you know, you got to know your strengths, what you're good at. That's right. That's, you mentioned the Galloway. When did you first discover them, and how did you discover the Galloway Training Group? Joined three years ago in 2009. Um, my sister, I think, have, my sister Katie had run with Galloway maybe a year or two before, and what happened was I... Had been running since 2002, but nothing ever that long. You know, maybe seven, eight miles here. You know, that was as long as, I think the longest run I ever ran, period, was mm -hmm. nine miles. The longest race, I done, I ran 10 miles once. And I decided for my 30th birthday in 2009, I wanted to run a marathon. So that was my goal. I normally don't like to tell my age, but whatever. <laughs> um, a lady never tells. So... What happened was my I had done a half marathon that April, the Moore half, which was, I don't know if you remember, it was a woman's mar half marathon. Yeah, it was only, yeah. It was so hot. And I realized I didn't train properly. And I just realized I, I did a lot of things wrong because I just didn't know any better. And I ended up finishing. My time wasn't that terrible. But I realized that I didn't want to train for a marathon by myself. Mm -hmm. So my sister had suggested Galway, and she loved the community, and I said, you know what, why not? So I went to one of the information sessions, and I just really liked the people. Everyone was really, really friendly. This is in New York now? Yeah, yeah, this is in okay. New York in 2009, and it was great. I mean, I really do love the method. I don't do it for shorter distances. Like, my kind of cutoff is I can run, like, 13, 14 miles straight, and I like to try to do it without the Galway mm -hmm, method, mm -hmm. but anything over that... I always run it, mm -hmm. and it just, it, it really helps. I mean, I, I compare it, like I did a 17-mile run once straight, and I was hurting the next day, and the next day after that. And it was interesting, I did maybe 23 miles two weeks ago, and I felt fine. And it, it, it is it the Galloway method. Yeah, and it, it is always interesting because people, you know, say, "Oh, you stop. I, if I stop, I would never start again." I go, "That's not how it works." Because the thing is, you're consistently taking the breaks from the beginning, so you're conserving energy. Yes, even at the end, sometimes I do get a little bit tired, but I never feel like, "Oh no, I have to start running again." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it, if anything, it's just a. I, I look. You look for more to the breaks. That's right. Um, where the beginning, you're kind of like, oh, great, I have to take a break. I, I want to keep on running. But the, the key is to, to do those. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, it's nice. You can always tailor, uh, as you have. Sometimes you don't need it for the 10-milers or 13-milers. Yeah. But you know for beyond that, you should take the breaks because you'll recover faster. Yeah. And you've already got the experience. Yeah. That's great. Well, what are some of your future challenges in terms of races? I know you're going to do New York with your dad. Is that the big one? Well, it's funny. I, I'm sort of obsessed, and I've learned this from many people in the Galloway group who don't who do marathons every single weekend, it feels like, because um, I'm still very friendly with a lot of them. My goal is to do 50 in 50 states, or really more than 50 in 50 states because I've already done New York twice. Um, but I signed up. I was supposed to do Big Sur, uh, Sir, three weeks California. ago. Yeah, but what ended up happening was I went on a family vacation the week before to Ireland, and I go, I just drank too much beer. I go, there's no way. I hadn't booked my travel, but I couldn't follow a week in Ireland with a marathon. Um, so I do these things. There's a couple things. I am doing Chicago in October um, because I figure, why not? I've got friends in Chicago, free place to stay. So I just signed up. Um, sometimes I'll, I'll just impulsively sign up for races I think that are going to sell out. And at the end of the day, if I can't end up doing them, oh, I, I'm out 100 bucks, which is annoying, but rather do that than have to wait another year. Right. I also sometimes do these races called Tough Mudders, 
which what is that? they are amazing. They're basically 10 to 12 mile obstacle courses that they had them. It only the, the company only started about two years ago, and it's blown up. So their first one was maybe two years ago in the Poconos, and now they have them everywhere. So I actually I did one in Vermont about a year ago in May, and then I did one in November, New Jersey, and I just did one in the Poconos in April. Okay, this is the one where you jump over fire. You jump over fire, you crawl under things, you run, do trail running, yeah, you jump into water, and they're long. I mean, and the key is it's all, it's all teamwork, so it's not about, they don't even time you. I mean, there are some guys, military guys, that go hardcore and they're super competitive, but generally speaking, it's really not about that. It's about teamwork and I, I've done it with great people I've always had great teams because let's face it like I'm not that strong so I really need that help with people pulling me up I don't have that arm strength and I, I'm a big girl so these guys I mean I'll literally have to crawl on their shoulders or step on their shoulders for them to get me over a wall my god those are great teammates I know they're amazing and I always <laughs> feel bad but it, it's fun it's like a different thing I mean a lot of these mud runs have become huge the past few years there's so many there's a warrior dash the rebel runs is it the same team or you make new team members along the um, way you know it's basically I've had different teams all the time it's basically whoever wants to do it uh -huh. and uh if I find a group, you know, I have a group of friends who want to do them. Well, I've seen the pictures, and you're covered from oh head God. to toe with and mud. You can't even recognize. I know. It's funny. After there's one, my mom saw pictures of me on, on Facebook, and I had bruises everywhere, and she was horrified. Then I go, Mom, it's a good way for me to meet men. And she goes, well, then it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, is it a good way to meet men? I mean, you, you, there's lots of cute guys there. But the problem is, you know, they, they'll say they'll have, like, a party afterwards, but everyone's too cold and muddy to want to hang out. I think if you do one in the summertime, it's not, it's not as bad. But, you know, usually a lot of times you're jumping in cold water. So you just want to get out of your clothes and go to a bar um, and hang out. Oh, yeah. cool. Hmm. Now, you're also a blogger. What do you blog about? TV. Um, I'm a huge, huge TV fan. I work in television professionally, um, but outside of that, I I just love watching TV. What are some of your favorite Oh, God, programs? there's too many. But my blog is called the DVRfiles.com uh, because I record everything and then watch it late. But, I mean, it, I always say it depends on the night of the week. I would say, for, honestly, my all-time favorite show is probably The Golden Girls because it's so consistent. Like, you can, no matter, if I'm in a bad mood or if I watch something scary and I need to, like, cleanse my palate before I go to bed so I don't have nightmares, I put on Golden Girls. Um, I love Game of Thrones, which is on HBO, although I'm behind this season. I'm really loving Veep with Julia Louis-Dreyfus. Oh, okay. It's amazing. Um, Girls isn't too bad. I love Amazing Race. I mean, I watch everything. I watch trashy well, let's, reality. Let's talk about Girls because that's a controversial yeah. HBO thing. Tell us about that. What do you think of the characters? Well, it's interesting. I, I, um, there have been a few. I haven't watched them all, but I've watched most of them. I hated the pilot. Um, basically, to people who don't know, the show is about four friends. Young women. Women. 20s, I think. Like, right out of school. And they, they are living in Brooklyn, and it's, they just have, you know, first world problems, basically. And the thing is, it's, they're a little annoying, but once you get over that, it was okay. I could relate to some of the things that they went through, the awkward situations with guys, with with friends, with with a lot of things. But the thing that drove me crazy is that the first episode opens up with the, the main character, Hannah, moaning because her parents, she graduated from college two years earlier, the character, and her she'd just been working an unpaid internship, and her parents had been fully supporting her, and they told her they were going to cut her off, and she just wind and wind and wind and I just said that's when you know that you become your parent and you're all like, just get a goddamn job like you were screaming that at the oh TV. my god I was getting so mad she was so whiny I was all shut up get a job it work you're not my first job out of college and I grew up in a nice town and I you know I went to a good college whatever but when I graduated when I moved home I substitute taught you know, for that month between my college graduation and the schools mm -hmm, got out. Mm -hmm. And I was a summer camp counselor. I mean, we're not talking, I mean, we're talking $10 an hour, if that. I mean, it might have been less than. And then, you know, I did, there was a brief two, two three month period where I wasn't, well, actually six month period where I wasn't working. Mm -hmm. But when I did start working, um, you know, I worked nine to five and then I realized I moved into an apartment. I couldn't afford the apartment, so I got a second job. And I loved it. You know, I didn't know, looking back, it was so much fun. And it's something you could only do when you're 23, 24. I could never, 
you know, I would work my regular job nine to five, then work at my restaurant job six to midnight, then go out drinking till three. I could never do that now. I would never <laughs> want to do that now. Um, this is before your running days. <laughs> this is before. It was actually kind of simultaneous. Um, but it definitely... It was it was fun, but it was definitely well, it was definitely burning the candles at both ends. Oh my ends god, there. yeah! And like I said, you could only do that when you're young. And so now it's interesting because I'm transitioning. You know, I do I do stand up, but I'm I'm focusing almost more on the writing right now because it's what I love to do. I mean, I love television. I love writing about it. I tend to look at things more tongue in cheek and see the humor, and also not just write about shows that are on the air right now, but also write about shows that are off the air. Um, like Golden Girls. Like the Golden Girls. <laughs> um, you know, just remembering random shows that no one else remembers. Like there was a show called Sister Kate that I think was on for one season in 88, 90, and Jason Priestley was not on it before 902 and 0. Mm -hmm. And they had a guest appearance by Millie Vanilli. And the funny thing is I've been tracking. I wrote about this in my blog because I will never forget this episode. And this was right before Millie Vanilli came out as being frauds. And I was in fifth You're grade. The lip sinkers, yes. Yeah. I was obsessed with Millie Vanilli. Listened to them all the time on a tape, of course. And the, you cannot find this clip. You can find anything on the internet. You can find anything. You can find any obscure movie, whatever, but you cannot find Millie Vanilli singing on Sister Kate. And it's killing me. And it's like now my mission. To find that. Yeah, but so, it's, it's So that's hard. one of your future challenges. I right? know. It's, it's, it's definitely. Well, great. Listen, well, we, you're going to perform for us tonight okay. a little bit of your routine. Tell, can you tell us a little bit about the routine? Sure. Okay. Um, you know, for me, I tend to be pretty self-deprecating. I make fun of myself. You know, I got the glasses. I'm a little bit of a nerd. Um, so I just kind of like to talk about my experiences, kind of combining, like, my awkward childhood and teenage years with my awkward adulthood and just having fun, not taking myself too seriously. All right. Well, with that, we'll take a break, and we'll come back, and then Liz will perform for us. So stay tuned. Thank you. Hey, everyone. I'm Liz. I've been wearing glasses since I was 13. When I first got them, people said, Liz, glasses make you look smart, which is exactly how you want to look when you're 13, because <laughs> guys dig smart chicks. I mean, who needs the easy cheerleader girl when they could have me, the girl who knew how to spell statistician in eighth grade, S T A T, too hot. Hmm. I mean, they wanted the flat chested girl who knew every single word to the Les Mis soundtrack in French, like, I am one in you, Javert, but in French. Because it could help the guys get A's, the other girls could help them get hepatitis A. What would you want? <laughs> Probably hepatitis double D's, you greedy, greedy bastard. I went away to college, and it was interesting. I always like to attack my studies with a vengeance, and I took that same approach to the dining hall where I could have gotten an A for eating. I took the all-you-can-eating part of the buffet literally, and so before you know it, I gained the freshman 15 times four, and I gained it again my sophomore year, my junior year, and senior year. And because eating disorders aren't contagious, I uh, had to join Weight Watchers when I moved back home with my parents in Massachusetts, which was a very depressing time in my life. But I will tell you this about Weight Watchers. Single men out there, it is a great place to meet women because <laughs> they're cheap dates and they're kind of vulnerable. Not that I recommend you taking advantage of someone, but think of it this way. You get in them before they look good. They're cheap dates because you take them out to a steakhouse and they're all, I want a ribeye with extra Bernays sauce and ooh, give me some of those potato or gratins and load up the wine. You can say, honey, don't eat that order of salad. It's not supporting the program. And you're not being an asshole. You're just being a supportive boyfriend. I fortunately did lose the weight and lost 40 pounds, and people always say, oh, congratulations, and I go, it really wasn't that hard to stop eating Twinkies <laughs> and Ding Dongs <laughs> for breakfast. Um, but it hasn't changed too much in my life. It's funny, someone asked me, I had to go to my doctor recently, and she said, Liz, are you sexually active? And I'm like, define what you mean by the word <laughs> active. I'm more like sexually dormant like a volcano like I could have sex today or it could be another 400 years I remember you know the Olympics are coming up and everyone will make a joke a lot of comics if you go to a club will say I have sex like an Olympian once every four years ha 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 and I say I'm not that bad I'm more like sex like a U.S. figure skating champion like once a year if I'm lucky it's a good year I am from Massachusetts yay uh 
and I, I love going home because people in Massachusetts think I live this big glamorous life in New York City. I work in television. They think, oh, Liz is a working comedian. They don't need to know that I just have a job and then tell jokes on the side and that all my jokes are about how I don't have any kind of sexual kind of sex <laughs> or that I used to be overweight. <laughs> to them, I'm this glamorous person who doesn't take the Feng Hua $15 Chinatown bus every time I go home. But it is interesting because my parents, who I love very dearly, have never changed my bedroom since I was 14. So I call it the dead girl's room. <laughs> it's like I died when I was 14 and they could not bear to live away f th from that memory. So they've kept every single poster and, and sticker and, and my same bedspread, my same furniture. It's a little bit creepy. I'm a single woman living in New York City. So guess what that means? I online date. And it is... If you ever want to feel really, really great about yourself, don't don't online date. But you know, sometimes it's the only option that you can get. So, I, I once put it out. This is a particularly low budget moment of mine on Craigslist. I don't know what I was thinking, and I did women seeking men, not casual encounters or anything dirty because I'm Catholic. I'm a good girl. <laughs> and I put on my ad, I said, you know, I'm a girl who likes, who wears glasses and likes sports and I like to read Harry Potter. So I give off a librarian vibe, <laughs> but I'm a fun librarian. Ha 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 ha. So of course you can imagine I got so many responses that were kind of like, can you send me some sexy librarian JPEGs? And I said, <laughs> Uh, I said fun librarian, not sexy librarian. I mean, I could take you a picture of me reading Madame Bovary, but I don't think that's what you want. Um, people have this idea that when I take on my glasses that I become this really like sexy vixen thing. Uh, no, I just become a klutz and spill the dinner or the salad that you just bought me. Um, I'm Liz Simon. Thank you guys for having me.